Coming up next on The Voice of Alabama Politics, our special guests today are President Pro Tem Dale Marsh and Speaker of the House Mac McCutcheon. We also take a look at the IT boondoggle and Justice Tom Parker says he didn't take Indian money. I will tell you right now, uh, they don't look like Indians to me. Guess old Uncle Tom didn't think they looked like Indians either. All this and much, much more coming up next on The V. to the voice of Alabama politics, where we tackle the tough issues so you have the hard facts. I'm your host, Bill Britt, and today is a special edition. We have President Pro Tem Dale Marsh. Welcome, Senator Marsh. Thanks, Bill. Glad to be here. Nice to have you on. You have one of the toughest jobs in politics, herding kittens that all have a mind of their own. So I'm told. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've been doing this for some time now. How how has it been? I mean, you've you've seen a lot, and Bill, it's been fine. Of course, uh, since 2010, I was elected the pro tem of the Senate, and uh, I'm very proud. I was unanimous by all my colleagues, including the Democrats. Uh, and after four years, I was revoted to serve again. So apparently, they're, they're somewhat pleased. Um, it's you know, it can be difficult. Uh, you you've got uh, as I explained it, 35 CEOs in the chamber. Yeah. All have the same power and uh, working and manipulating through that uh, to to come to keep the thing moving in the right direction uh, is difficult sometimes. But you know, I think we've done a pretty good job. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the Senate it, it seems to have been very. Uh, you know, it's a challenge, I'm sure, but coherent in message for the most part. Do you cr credit some of this to your business background because you are a very successful businessman? You know, I, I use the analogy of the CEO. Of course, <clears throat> I've owned a couple of businesses and, and uh, of course, was the CEO. Uh, used to working with, uh, and, and we were international, so I worked with uh, people from different uh, nationalities and different cultures. And I think all that obviously helps when you plan to work with people in different personalities. Uh, and, and I understand the the uh, the type personalities in the room, with the most of which are type A. Yeah, right. And and so uh, knowing that and going into that with that knowledge, I think has been helpful. And uh, you know, we've by by and large we've managed to get to work our way through those uh, when we get into these uh, situations. We have controversy. Uh, we're able to do that, and and it's not always Republican Democrat. Right. Right. Many times, my biggest challenge is on the Republican side of the aisle. Well, that's that's the problem with the supermajority. Sometimes, in the I would think, you, and I heard this. I don't know if it's true, but you started. You were an entrepreneur in college, right? My, my first company I started in college is a car customizing company, and I had good success with that. And uh, actually, took a pay cut when I took my first uh, job associated with my degree. Wow. But, but um, I've always loved business. Uh, I always, uh, I'm in business. I still have a machine shop and involved in a, a couple of other companies, uh, even though I sold my airspace company a few right. years ago. Um, and I always will be. I mean, it's my first, uh, you know, it's my first love. The legislature would have to say be about second. I think it's a, a reason to be there. I think it's important to have business people in the legislature understand those different issues. Uh, Percentage-wise, you know, I don't know. I'd say, you know, we don't exactly have a majority of business people in the legislature. Right. A lot of lawyers. <laughs> a lot of lawyers. A lot of, and I understand that. Yeah, I, I do. Know, yeah. I do. Uh, you've been an advocate on school choice, which is a very conservative issue. Nationally, always has <coughs> been. You've caught a lot of flack, even from us at times. Mm -hmm. uh, just passed uh, some new legislation. But... Could you give us your heart on this, what, what yeah, your thinking yeah. is? First of all, let me say, I'm a product of the public education system. Uh, my wife, I mean, I was, my children went to public school. Uh, my wife was a public school teacher, uh, taught for 15 years. 
Uh, but I've been a, a voice for school choice. I, I, I believe that that adds accountability to the public system. If, if you have no nothing else out there to compete, then you know it's it's basically a monopoly. Sure. And when you have, especially when you have situations with people who have a low income who don't have the choice to choose a private school and are in underperforming systems, then why would you not want to give them the ability to to have a choice and to help their ch their children? So. Yeah, it's not that I'm, I'm not. Listen, I've got a, right now I've got a group on the local level uh, working uh, with, with local teachers and public system to talk about issues and problems to help right. them move in the right direction. But at the same time, there's a place for school choice and alternatives to public school system. Well, and I, like I said, that's been a standard conservative issue. I was impressed that you decided to put a coalition of folks together to 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 examine it from all angles. And, uh, Absolutely. I mean, I, I want to hear from the from those who are in, in the trenches, if you will. Right. There's no better place to start than, than the classroom teacher. And that's what I'm doing. What will come of it, I'm not sure, but you've probably heard me talk about this uh, this statewide comprehensive education right. plan. Right. You know, as a business guy, I, I don't go into business without a plan. Right. And it seems strange to me. We've got three different entities of education. You've got K through 12, your post-secondary, vocational, uh, your higher ed. And yet they really don't, they don't talk enough, in my opinion, right. and work to help each other ob obtain their goals. And that's what I'm trying to work now. I'm going to continue to work with that to get a comprehensive plan. I think that makes all the sense in the world. I, I just, nobody's ever said that, you know. I mean, it's obvious yeah. on its face when you say it, but yeah. I haven't heard it before. You, you bring up about the two-year college system. I, they, you know, I was meeting with the chancellor the other day, and they, they really are turning things around, and they have having some success, especially with this workforce development. Yeah, right? and I yeah. attribute some of that to the change of the board. If you remember, they, we created a separate board for post-secondary. And, and you've got to remember that is supposed to be focused on vocational training right. and workforce development. Uh, and the board is comprised mainly, some education, but mainly the business community. Right. And they also have a direct link to the business community to understand what our needs are now and our future needs. And that's what you've got. To, you want to make sure that those people coming out, whether they're young people or people who've gone back to extend their careers, have opportunity when they come out. Right. And so it only makes sense. You want to offer a vocation there is a demand for. Well, and that's one of the things I, I remember. My dad uh, actually worked in uh, the technical colleges in North Carolina when they first started. And he told me, he said, look, son, it doesn't matter what you, you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, you need a trade. He said, because a trade, you'll always be able to feed yourself. And, and there's some great trades out there. I mean, the welders are making tons of money. And I, oh, yeah, there's great <clears throat> opportunities. Uh, when I was in school many a year ago, and I can remember it from fifth grade on, we had some sort of vocational training, even in the school. I took woodworking throughout right. and enjoyed it. Um, it, but, but what happened over time when those programs came out of the schools, it almost became as if, as if you were taking a second or a back seat if you didn't pursue higher education right. and, you didn't, and you looked at vocational training. And I think it had a, a negative connection with it, and, we've, and that's being changed. You've got career coaches, which we now have several years ago. We, we put money in the budget for career coaches to be in these high schools to let young people not, not – Tell them where they should go, right. but knowing what opportunities are out there, sure. and that have them great opportunities that may not be associated with high rate. Well, and not everybody wants to go to college, but you know, and not they, everybody needs to, right? And and, <laughs> and and they can come back later in their career, and if that's they right. want to go to college, they can do something else. But as you said, once you have a trade, that's with you for life, yeah. and you can always go back and use that trade. We're gonna have to take a break real quick, and we'll be right back. You're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Our special guest today is Senate President Pro Tem, Dale Marsh.
Azia Medical Spa offers a relaxing experience using customized skincare treatments and full line of physician grade products with professionals that can assist you in determining which treatment options will best help you achieve your desired results. Azia's massage therapies are popular for rejuvenation and relaxation, as well as relief of tired, aching, and sore muscles. Voted the best medical spa in Birmingham for three years in a row. Visit aziamedicalspa.com to schedule your appointment. Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Our special guest today is President Pro Tem of the Senate, Dale Marsh. I wanted to talk about some things that are, you know, unpleasant that we're having to deal with, and one of them is impeachment of the governor. It seems there's a rush to, to do something here. Uh, the governor has not been accused of any crimes or, or indicted or anything like that. The House seems to be going forward. I know you have a subcommittee in the Senate. What, what's your thinking or the members thinking at this point? You know, this is something we haven't faced before, Bill, and uh, obviously the House has to take action before we would do anything. <clears throat> what I did in just last week was worked with Cam Ward and Phil Williams, who are the chair and vice chair judiciary, and said, listen, get with, with the legislative reference, um, get with the secretary of the Senate, make sure we have a process in place should there be an impeachment vote in the House. Right. Okay, because... What people need to remember, if there is a vote and it's successful, the governor is, is not the governor. Right. And until we act, in which we would serve as a jury and the chief justice as a judge, uh, then there is basically no, well, the governor is out. Right. Uh, so we just need to be prepared should that take place. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, who, who knows what's going to happen right. there? But it's our obligation. Sure as the body that will have to deal with that to be prepared for that. And uh, I'm, I'm convinced that Senator Ward uh, and Senator Williams uh, will have everything in order. We'll probably do it through a resolution. And then the next quadrennium, they'll probably either have to adopt that resolution again to have a procedure, or they'll simply adopt their own procedure. So you don't see anything coming up this session? No, no I, but we'll be prepared if it does. Right. Well, we were looking it up the other day. There's only been eight governors that we can find that have ever been impeached in the history of the nation. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so that we, I don't know that we need black marks like that. Another controversial issue, and I, we only got a couple of minutes here, but I wanted to get your take on it, is the uh, prisons. Yeah, and I'm glad you bring that up. I mean, it's something no one likes to talk about that much. It's not glitzy, but it's a big problem of the state. And there's several problems within the problem. Number one, overcrowded, 180% capacity. Number two, a lot of mental health issues there and treatment to those. Sure. Uh, number three, people who are terminally ill that are in prison, and you ask yourself why are they still here? Can you do something? Right. And number four, vocational training. Recidivism is high. Part of that reason is people are not getting training in prison, which is available to them, right. but they're not taking it. So all those different pieces are trying to be addressed in one bill, and we had a great meeting yesterday with the caucus, uh, and I think we need to make sure if we're going to go into this area, we try to solve multiple problems at one time. And if we can do those, we'll be well served going forward. And that's, that's what I've asked the chairman to do the committee, and that's what we're waiting on. Well, it, you know, throwing money at a problem never solves it particularly well. But a plan, and, that, there and, again. and we've looked at what we've seen as a plan, and we still have a, a lot of questions. I, I would imagine you do, too. Absolutely. But we're, we're addressing those different layers from cost being one, location being another, as you've heard a lot of talk about. Uh, it, as I've mentioned, mental health, all those things have to be addressed before you can really come to a compromise, and that's what we're trying to do. Okay. We appreciate you spending time with us today, and you're always welcome to come back. Uh, is there anything going forward that you, you, you're you concentrating on in the Senate? Well, obviously, the budgets are always there. Yeah. Uh, you know, the general fund, everybody knows it. We've got $105 million of one-time money. We're going to be able to balance the budget this year. It's going to be gone next year. So we're already looking at next year how right. we're going to address that. So we'll continue to do those things and do all we can to build our economy. If we can build our economy, create more jobs, create more revenue, that in the, in the long run solves the problem. Yeah, that's, that's the big thing. That's get it. people working and get, them, right. get them paid. That's we right. appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. Right. My pleasure. Thank you. You're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. We'll be right back with news and analysis.
Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Susan, uh, Senator Marsh was uh, very, very good. He was. He's such a natural. He really is. He did a great job. And, of course, always with him, it's very informative. Yeah, it is. Uh, one of the things we did not get to, I had hoped to, but we ran out of time, is this Office of Information Technology. There, There's a bill in the Senate to create it as a standalone entity that would take in the ISD that does mm -hmm. all the computer networking, that's really over all the data that travels throughout the state government. And they're, they're wanting to place it under there. <coughs> and they've just got some real problems because OIT has been responsible for STARS, for eCare, or for CARES, for eStar, mm -hmm. to just name a few. And those have been total Failures. Yes, they have. And the way they're trying to structure the employees in there as well is a bit of a question. And they're trying to get 12 exceptions for employee salaries uh, when they don't have that many employees to start with. And what it would do would allow that department to set those salaries or the head of that department to set those salaries independent of any guidelines or whatever. Well, and, and you know, you take a look at the Department of Transportation employees, 4,000 plus. They only have five exceptions. Uh, this whole thing is just kind of smelly. Why now? You know, they tried to do it before. I, I kind of feel like the governor is trying to get the money that comes out of ISD, mm -hmm. and he wants the power that comes from controlling all the networks. That it does. could get and scary. That, 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 uh, the money that comes from ISD has been a power stick for a long time. Bill Newton used it quite effectively as a character you know, carrot and stick kind of thing for a long time. So that's very coveted money. And I mean, and, and I understand that that money also comes from when somebody can't use eStart or can't use STARS correctly and they call ISD and ISD has to fix it. So it's so kind yeah. of stinky there. Well, we only got a couple, uh, about a couple of seconds left, really. But uh, I wanted to talk about uh, a few, few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, Josh Moon did a story that linked uh, she, uh, Justice Tom Parker to some PAC transfers, mm -hmm. PAC, PAC transfers mm -hmm. that may have been linked to the Porch Creek Indians and other gaming interests. He's, we have, he says he did not take any money from Indian interests or gaming interests. But then, lo and behold, in November after the election, he took $5,000 from a pack that is known to be the Porch Creek Indians. How could he have not known it's that? It's Speed Pack, and I'm sorry, but... I, and I, as everybody knows, that's a Porch Creek uh, pack. There's no way around it. They put two hundred thousand dollars in that in December, and then of course Parker's trying to say that he gave it back, but he didn't give it back till February. Right. He had that money, and I think Moon's article on on the gaming issue mm -hmm. prompted him. And I tell you, it's very suspect. We got to end it on this, but that. His vote on the green track came on the heels of some of this stuff. I think it was three days apart, from my understanding. Very suspicious. Mm -hmm. You're watching The V, the voice of Alabama politics. Up next, the Speaker of the House, Mac McCutcheon. Welcome back to The V, the voice of Alabama politics. We're joined once again this week by Speaker Mac McCutcheon. Mr. Speaker, welcome. Thank you, Bill. It's good to be with you again. I've been thinking about we sh maybe should call this in the chamber with the Speaker. Okay, okay. Well, well that's, that's appropriate. That's where we are. Yeah. yeah. Well, we really appreciate you doing this. And, and, and so far, so good. A lot of, you know, there's been challenges. I, I know this week you had a very good uh, caucus meeting. I know you can't talk about caucus business, but uh, everything we're hearing is very positive. It, it was a good meeting. The members are really working good together, so we're excited about moving up. Yeah. Well, we know that secrecy is important, or privacy, so that you guys can really bear your souls, and, and, and people like us don't find out about it, right? Well, you know, when, when you're dealing with, with different pieces of legislation, and you're dealing with a, a group of members that are working together 
for a common cause, uh, then uh, it's good to have the opportunity to be able to uh, voice your opinions freely without worrying about the news media picking up on a story and trying to run a story that may be personal to another member. So it's always good to keep caucus business within the caucus and, and it helps the team work better together. I know uh, Majority Leader uh, Mickey Hammond stepped down this week. Uh, yes, uh, we will have an election coming up next week. Well, he's, uh, from all accounts, he's done a good job and uh, I guess things do change, right? Well, he's been the majority leader for six years, okay. and he's done some great work. I know uh, when uh, I came in in 06 and then the 2010 election, the Republicans took over. He became the majority leader and, uh, and uh, working through that quadranium and it was it was just a, he's done some good work he'd done a lot of good work on the immigration right, illegal immigration right. uh, well that was a tough one right it, there <laughs> oh it was tough and and it he spent a lot of hours working on yeah. that so I have a lot of respect for Mickey and his leadership yeah good good well uh, so there's some other things that are issues this week and positive things on uh, Fire, fire departments, is it that uh, the the uh, we're, we're we're looking at some legislation that's uh, going to be addressed dealing with the uh, exhaust systems in fire departments. Uh, sprinkler systems bill is out there on the pick list to be looked at. Uh, we we've uh, we've we we addressed a special order calendar this week that had um, uh, the regular order bills on it. Right. One was dealing with uh, farm products in the schools, right. uh, education program, which is a good one. There were a couple of more bills that we passed, and and that special order went through very well this week. We're looking at another special order this week, which will be the first one that the actual committee members made picks on. Okay, and so. So this will be the one that you're talking about. We'll have some of the bills in it dealing with the fire departments, some education issues. One of our agenda bills uh, should be coming up uh, dealing with the school safety issue. And I think that'll be a good piece of legislation for the state. So we're, we're excited about the next special order. I know things got uh, held up a little bit. I, I know Representative Chris England, Democrat, has brought up to us and others, has gone around the state, that he believes that the governor must uh, order a special election to elect a U.S. senator to replace Jeff Sessions uh, almost immediately. And we're, we're hearing that's coming out of uh, the, the leadership is looking at that now. We don't know if anything's resolved, but Governor Bentley seems to think he, y'all's, it's y'all's fault that he can't hold a special election. Well, we're, we're looking at uh, legal interpretations of the Constitution and, and uh, what his authority is in regards to that. And then, of course, Representative England has a very good argument dealing with the fact that this is the governor's responsibility right. to do that. So from my position as speaker, I'm listening to both sides and trying to uh, work with uh, the executive branch as well as my representatives and uh, some legal opinions so that we can come up with uh, with something but at this point right now as of right now we're allowing that decision to be made by the governor in his office well and, and uh, representative england had a great argument he said if i say uh, i owe you money forthwith and i wait six months to give it to you that's not a really good deal is it <laughs> well that's true that's true and and i think another discussion that's been involved in this is is the political advantage that a person would have after staying in office for two sure, years sure and of course that's at the bottom of the that's that's the basis for the argument if you will right. so and, and and i can respect that we've got we've got some other people that may want to run for that office oh yeah that's going to be a crowded field we hear yeah. jimmy rain and we hear uh uh, we hear uh, Judge Moore might run. I mean, that, oh, is that right? Okay, that's, that's the name. I, I ain't heard his name. Yet. Well, I tell you, they should be afraid if, if Justice Moore decides to run. He he does pretty good if he decides well, to do it. He's had some good statewide campaigns. Yes, that's for sure. Yes. Um, well, just a quick second. I wanted to go to prisons. You know, that's that's a big issue that's looming out there. The governor wants eight hundred million dollars bond. How are your members feeling about this? We we uh, Bill, we we <coughs> haven't. Uh, drop the bill in the House. Right. We're watching the bill in the Senate and we are still gathering information 
about the legislation, and th there's some there's some good discussions going on. We're we've got little groups here and there that are sitting around talking about the issues. We're watching the Senate. They're having some good uh, debates up there and some concerns up there. At this point, I don't think it's a given that we're going to be able to uh, pass an $800 million bond issue for the prisons. I think uh, there's going to be some real uh, hard questions asked about should we do this as pilot program? Should we start with a prison for the ladies and maybe one for the men's? Should we uh, reduce that bond issue from 800 down to 500 million dollars? So th there's some, and, and another thing that, uh, that I'm hearing from members is that we need to be looking at the, the Sheriff's Association and their county jail system mm. and the inmates that they are housing for our DOC. Right along with the intake procedures and the legislation that we passed a couple of years ago dealing with the prison reform issues. Right. I think that all of these things need to be a part of this discussion. I, I would agree, and I think the prison reform has probably not uh, had time to make it through everything, and, and I think you and I talked about this intake evaluations can be done in such a way that we handle our prisoners better. That's I, I agree. We got about 30 seconds. Any, anything on your mind in particular? Well, we um, uh, th there's still a good discussion going on right now about the infrastructure okay. and funding for infrastructure. So that issue has not gone away, and in some ways I'm, I'm, I'm very appreciative of that because we started a good initiative last year right. uh, talking about the need for infrastructure. Uh, the county commissions are looking at it, as well as the municipalities and the state. So those discuss discussions are still ongoing. Well, so, we all want roads and bridges. It's just do we want to pay for it? Absolutely. Right? <laughs> that that's the bottom line. Yeah. Well, a, a, a person told me said that uh, uh, Speaker McCutcheon, everybody wants street lights and concrete sidewalks and curbs and gutters, but who wants to pay for it? That's them? right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Uh, we, we appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you for coming to the House. Thank okay. you. We want to thank Speaker McCutcheon for joining us again this week. You've been watching The V. You watch us because we watch them. <laughs>